Good afternoon, folks. I sure appreciate y'all coming on in. Now, this is our first video with me reading these stories, and before I get there, I want to talk to you about my hat now. I had a lot of comments on this hat. They said, where did you get that hat? Somebody said it was an ugly hat. Somebody said it's a good-looking hat. But this doggone old hat is for big people and fat ones just like me. Well, it's big enough to shed the rain, big enough to keep the sun off of me, big enough to fan with. Now, I ain't wearing it today because I'm going to read these stories. Now, also, let you know, so many of you asked me to read these doggone things, and I'm not memorizing them now. I'm going to read them, just like you was reading a story to you, young as at night, before they go to bed. So the name of this story today is Cannon and a Cookin'. Well, old Buster Dunn asked if and Jesse could go up for a couple of weeks to Kentuck with them to his Aunt Gertrude's. There was all manner of doings there, and Buster wanted Jesse's company and having some fun. Plus, you got to know that Buster wasn't about to be there in that house by his himself with them spooks are carrying on like to do. He wanted Jesse to see for his himself what was going on upstairs. Now, I don't know if y'all rightly remember this or if I ever told y'all this before another story, but that's where them spooks come out there when his Grandpa Gus and Grandma was there. Well, them two done rode up a bus up to Paris where the house was on the farm. They had a nice little ride up there and seen some very interesting sights on the way. They went through Nashville and stopped for a spell and seed Music Row. Well, Buster seed old Harold Jenkins a coming out of store and hollered at him. Well, Jesse knowed Harold too, but not as good as Buster, as he was over by his and Ken folk in Mississippi, a lot with his and folks. When Buster, Jesse, Hire, and Walter would sneak out on out to the 1170 Club at the Y down by the river, Old Harold would be a playing his and music there with his and band. They got to be right good friends with him and his and folks know theirs as well. When he was a playing, he called his and self Conway Tweety and the Tweety Birds. Ain't that a hoot? Well, old Harold took the name from Conway, a town just north of Little Rock. Well, I reckon it's kind of northwest a little bit. Well, Harold also liked Tweety Bird in the cartoon, so he just got the name from that. Well, heck fire, Buster and Jesse remembered when they used to get to go over to his and house and watch them cartoons with him and his and brother back when their folks used to visit about him. Well, yeah, Buster and Jesse went to see the Parthenon, too. Sure was a pretty building. The bus stopped at Crossville, and Buster's very own first cousin, Cecil, that's old ish, you know, lived there with Buster's Uncle Roscoe and Aunt Mamie. Well, Buster called up Cecil, and he come on over and got him while they laid over and visited for a spell and got a meal fit for a king from Aunt Mamie. She sure could make some gravy and biscuits. Well, Cecil was a right night wore down, said he'd been running shine the night before and hadn't got much rest. Well, Cecil and Uncle Roscoe had a race that night, too, so it all worked out just right on the time and all. But when Ish left on out in that Camaro of his, and he give Buster and Jesse each a quarter really good blue moon out. Said that batch was from the pews on his and Ma's side. Now that stuff would burn pretty and blue as you could, oh, as you could just tell. I, I'm telling you, just bright, brighter blue than the sky. That doggone stuff would go down sweet like and smooth pretty much until he got to the bottom, then she had to kick like a bew. Boy, oh boy, when you took a pull on that there shine, it would sure light up your life, though, I tell you. Well, Cecil tried to get the boys to stay a while, but they remembered what happened the last time they was there and didn't want to be in no Marion, that's for sure. They got into Paris in the evening, and Buster's Uncle Melvin picked them up. They had a right nice supper, and some of the Crawfords was in from Oklahoma over at Buster's Cousins, and they was doing some picking and grinning that night. Well, all of them went on over and enjoyed the fiddle, playing and the singing and dancing all till late. Well, Jesse told Buster's cousin he was going to learn that there fiddle playing as soon as he got him one. Feller says to Jesse that he'd be glad to teach him if he'd come round. Well, the next morning, they helped with a few chores and then went with Uncle Melvin on a little tour of the countryside. There was old Buck Passer in the pasture living the life of Riley. As good looking a horse flesh you ever did see, and him being the 1966 horse of the year made him right famous. But he was a gentle cuss now. 
All they'd have to do is whistle and hold out an apple or a lump of sugar, and old Buck Passer would amble on, amble on over there for his treat. He'd just stick his old head over the fence and wait till they give him something good. But he was a right good old horse, I'll tell you. Good company. Well, Buster and Jesse would stop by every morning. They was there at Gertrude's place for a visit with him. One morning, the trainer and owner dropped by Uncle Melvin's and told the boys, since they got to be such good friends and all with Buster Passer, why don't they come on over for dinner and visit him in the stables with all the other horses and just look around a bit at a racehorse operation? Well, the boys was plum tickle pink over that invite, I tell you. Oh, hired had been envying them for sure. That weekend, Mr. Ogden Phelps and Mr. Bill Winifred, Buck Passer's owner and trainer, stopped by to take the boys to the racetrack with them. Old Buck Passer was retired, but they had other horses at Claiborne Farms that were running. It was the first real horse race they'd ever been to. Well, Buster and Jesse know that Walter and Hired would just eat their heart out because they couldn't be here with them. A real live horse race, and at the Kentucky Derby at that. The boys had a Morgan hit out a piece and asked if they picked a horse would Mr. Bell bet their silver dollar for him. He said he sure enough would do that. Well, Buster up and picked number seven, that's his lucky number, and told Mr. Bell to put it on his nose. Well, Jesse put some thought into his and bet and asked Mr. Bell what horse Mr. Phelps was running. Impressive was his name, so Jesse bet his and dollar on him. If that don't beat all, Damascus won his in race and paid 12 to 1. Then in the 7th, Impressive won his in race and paid 8 to 1. Both boys made a few dollars on their first real horse race and it was all on the television to boot. Well, Buster and Jesse kept all their ticket stubs and racing programs for keepsakes to show everybody back home. Well, Mr. Phelps was really hopping for joy that his and horse won. And he bought the boys all they could eat and drink and they got to sit in the owner's box where it was real comfortable like. Well, it sure was a fun day, and both boys thanked Mr. Phelps and Mr. Winifred for their kindness. They told Buster and Jesse to come round about any time and to bring Walter and Hired with them next time they come up. Well, one morning about 6 a.m., Aunt Gertrude told the boys she needed a little help of cannon to get ready to go with her. Now, Buster and Jesse had a tad bit of cannon experience with their maws, but nothing like what they was going to get into. When they got to the cannon house, there was women and youngins just working away at cannon. Well, first off, there was mason jars to fetch and burl, peeling apples and peaches and fetching bushel baskets of all manner of fruits and vegetables was the most work the boys done in quite a spell. Wasn't hard work, and... Buster and Jesse was a visiting with other folks along the way whilst doing their stepping and fetching. There were some awful pretty little gals there, and they took a shine to them, too. Jesse always had one or two a-winking at him. Well, finally Aunt Gertrude hollered for Buster and Jesse to bring in the corn. Corn? Jesse says, corn? You mean we got a shuck and huck, hull all that corn? Well, there was probably about 20 bushel. It had to get shucked, hulled, washed, and prepared for canning. Well, Jesse was fit to be tied, I tell you. Had a conniption fit and told Buster that he knowed he dearly hated corn. He just couldn't stand the stuff. Well, Jesse, Jesse never did eat no corn, but it was Buster's favorite. Aunt Gertrude was listening when Jesse told Buster the only way he liked corn was to drink it. <laughs> oh, that boy's a mess. Of course, Aunt Gertrude knowed what that meant. She told Jesse to fetch in the baskets and Buster and another feller and a gal would do the shucking and the hulling. She said for Jesse to help the Williams gal doing the burling of the jars. Well, Jesse was plumb scared of her, I tell you. He remembered what done happened with them Hooper gals. And this one was a making eyes at him something fierce. Well, Buster hollered over to Jesse and says to him, Remember what Walter said? Hold a line now, just hold a line. Well, that didn't ease Jesse's mind one bit because he heard her ma ask Aunt Gertrude if Jesse could come on over one evening as little Mary was to be playing and a singing for folks and of course Buster too. Well, Jesse excused his himself and whispered to Buster to hate on out to the truck and help him for a minute. Well, Jesse said he just wasn't up to all this here courting in these here hills. Reckon they'd ought to get on back. 
Well, Buster told Jesse not to worry and that he'd protect him from the clutches of them women. Buster said all that sweet talking was a getting Jesse into trouble. Well, Jesse said he was just a being polite and all and didn't mean nothing by it. His and Mama always said to be nice to women folk, and he just for the life of him could not figure out what he was a doing to get them gals all riled up like they was. Well, Buster said it was okay. He wasn't doing nothing to cause it. But he done read up on it, and it was just plain in Jesse's nature. It was them pheromones of his'n. That's why Jesse didn't like no corn. Well, Jesse said to Buster, you don't say. You ain't a funny me now, are you, Buster? Well... Buster told Jesse, nope, he wasn't doing that, but he had his and fingers crossed behind his back, though. Well, then Jesse told Buster to move on over, and Jesse lit into that corn with shucks to fly. Heck, they was done in no time flat with them 20 bushel. Them two boys had a real good time up in Kentucky, you know. Uncle Melvin, he let them shoot his gophers out there in the pasture and all with his new 223 rifle. Them old things, they just carried the black plague and all. They wasn't no good them farmers to even eat their own. Well, they'd eat breakfast, sit on the porch for a spell, and take pot shops with them gophers. Burton there cleaned out the whole bunch of them during the visit. Well, Jesse heard a caterwauling and see them lights a blinking one night, and he sure enough believed Buster about them spooks. Because Buster told him all about it. Said he ain't lying none about that. He's real serious like now. Well, they helped in the turbacky field and went to the mammoth cave, too. On the way back home from the cave, Buster got to telling on his himself about a chemistry set he done got for Christmas. He got to studying on all of Jesse's business dealings, and he was wanting to come up with ideas to make something new or some of their products better. Well, Buster got to experimenting in his and Grandma's kitchen and asked Jesse if he'd hear that Grandma was having some work done over at the house. Well, Jesse said he'd hear that. Well, Buster said he got to mixing up some stuff in that chemistry set and left for a bit, and when he come back, it was a smoking and shooting sparks, and he didn't know what all. Finally, it went to a rumbling, and he run. <laughs> well, that chemistry set done blowed up and took out most of everybody the kitchen, cabinets, and the table, too. Blacked up the balls right, the walls right smart and ceiling and left a smell that was worse than ten skunks. Grandpa Gus had to get Mr. Kane, the town carpenter, to get on over there and get to making repairs. Well, Buster didn't get in no trouble, but there sure enough wasn't no more chemistry experimenting going on in Grandma's kitchen, that's for sure. And by the way, Mr. Kane wasn't no kin to Jimmy Joe. Well, so them two weeks went so fast, Buster and Jesse couldn't believe it. They had a high old time in Kentucky, and Aunt Gertrude and Uncle Melvin was really a sight for sore eyes and treated them just like as his own. Seeing as how they didn't ever have no young, as they sure did like young folks to come around a lot, and they said they enjoyed their company and be proud to have them back. There was a story or two for Walter and Hired when they got on back home, and for sure they would want to come back on the next trip. Well, all of them said their goodbyes, and they was took to the bus depot with sack lunches and some of them canned goods that they'd helped put up. Well, letters was wrote to Buster Grandma. Grandpa Gus and Aunt Gertrude was a teared up as they left on out on the bus. But the dangest thing done happened right about then. That gal, Mary Williams, run up to Jesse and throwed her arm around his neck and hugged him up real good and tight and put a lip lock on the boy that he just couldn't get out of. Well, after a bit, when they come up for her, she told Jesse to come on back and she'd be there waiting. Well, Jesse run on to that bus just like a cat with your tail stepped on. When Buster got seated beside Jesse, Jesse said to Buster that them pheromones hadn't ought to bother them gals since he took the shucking corn, should they? Well, Buster said it was too late for that gal, seeing as how she got a dose before we got him off of his and shucking and hulling the corn. Well, Jesse said he allowed he might not come back soon because he couldn't take no shotgun wedding. He's just too young for that. Well, that dang bus done blowed a head gasket on the way back to Arkansas. Well, Buster and Jesse had to get off with the rest of the passengers and set a spell till they got another ride. Seemed like it was going to be a good spell before they could get a replacement bus for them, and a feller and his wife called some of their family to come get them. They lived over about Bucks, North Tennessee, by a Loretta Lynn's dude ranch. Well, after talking for a bit, the Robertsons, that was their name, asked if they'd like to 
ride to their place and then leave when the bus comes through to Arkansas. Well, Buster and Jesse took them up on the officer right, uh, offer right quick like. It was on the way home and the folks was real nice. They had Buster and Jesse call their folks and their people all said to tell them where they was and when they would be home after what all had happened. They all got in late and called the bus company the next morning to find out when they could leave on the next bus through. Well, Greyhound said it would run the day after and to be at the bus stop there at Bucksnort at 10 a.m. Well, that left a day to kill, so they had plenty of time to explore and rest up too. Well, a bunch of fellers said there was a kind of party over by the river and to come on over. The son and daughter of the Robertson took them with them when they went and was welcomed by the Curtis family having the party. The Robertsons was a coming after chores. There was horseshoe pitching and washer pitching and card playing and all sorts of games for the little ones. But the fun was just the beginning, I'm telling you. The Curtis boys done rounded up some young pigs and greased them up real good with the lard. There was a prize to be won for whoever could ride a greased pig the longest. Well, Jesse was a lot smaller than Buster, you know, so Buster done volunteered Jesse for the contest. Old Jesse took to riding that pig like a duck to water, I tell you. He not only rode that pig once it, he rode it twice it for the fun of it. He done won the prize. It was an apple pie baked by Jane Ann Robertson. When Jesse seen that pretty gal uh, coming towards him with that pie, he went to hollering, where's the corn grip? Well, Buster busted out laughing so hard he took to crying. Well, Buster chased down Jesse and told him that the Robinson gal was engaged to one of the Curtis boys. So he had not a worry in the world about his and pheromones getting on nobody. Well, there was also swimming down at the river where you swam after a greased watermelon and Buster got that. Buster was a powerful good swimmer, you know. Well, after all the festivities, the Roberts had took them all back to their house for the night and then on to the bus stop the next morning. None of the folks was a bit hungry after all the food they'd had the night before. Some of the best barbecue you ever put a lip lock on. And Buster and Jesse got fuller than a tick, that's for sure. Well, Mr. Robinson let the boys off at the bus stop the next morning on his way to work, where they all said farewell. There was some new friends made and the offer to come again soon. It was a quiet and peaceful ride back home, and they were glad to get back.